Good evening and a very warm welcome to what is our 12th Wednesday webinar for World Horse Welfare. So you're very welcome to join us. You're joining us by Zoom. Um, if you've done this before, you'll know the crack. We just have to slightly mark time whilst we wait for our, wait for our Facebook Live um, audience to join us. Uh, but by joining us by Zoom, it's great because not only uh, can you uh, listen to the two great presentations we've got this evening, but you'll be able to take part in the couple of poll questions that we have for you this evening. And as I'll say uh, later on, it, these are not tests on anyone's knowledge, but it's just a great way of getting people to uh, um, interact and and, and start thinking about the topics that we're focusing on this evening. So a, a second welcome to all those Facebook live viewers who are joining us for tonight's when, uh, Wednesday webinar, which is our 12th one in this series. And I hope you won't mind if I just say, uh, some of you might have joined us for all 12 webinars. If you have, please let us know. We might sort of provide a sort of a, a long service good conduct certificate for, 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 for you. But equally, you'll appreciate that these kind of webinars, when we started them back in mid-June, um, was uh, it was a, a, a toe in the water for us. And we've been really delighted, by very delighted and, and thankful to the speakers who've, who've, who've taken us on this journey but obviously the great feedback we've had for them and obviously to put these on ha has taken an effort from from the home team and one of those is is Alana Alana um, who's been very much driving this whole uh, Wednesday webinar initiative. She's uh, shortly off to start a family uh, with her husband Nick and I would just wanted to say very publicly to thank Alana for all her um, efforts in getting our Wednesday webinars. To, it's a, such a, a great place but also to wish her and Nick um, uh, all the very best over the coming weeks and we look forward to uh, Alana returning once we're on our 138th, well it won't be that many but whatever we are webinars later on next year. So thank you very much for joining. We very much want to make this a two-way thing. So if you are joining us on uh, a Zoom, then please do use the chat function to chat amongst yourselves. But please, it'd be great for Q&As for uh, after the two presentations, please use the Q&A function. And if you're you, uh, joining us on Facebook Live, please um, use the comments function. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, please do share the video. And I just wanted to let you know that the previous 11 webinars and tonight's will be uh, are all up on our YouTube channel so if you do enjoy them please do share them um, and, and tell your friends and, and family about them but also um, we are conti going to continue to run the, the webinars into the new year so if you've got um, any th subjects you'd like us to cover then please do let us know. Now, at this stage, I have to do the very complex thing of sharing my screen, which um, after um, uh, 11 attempts, I'm, I'm getting better at, but still a little bit slow. Um, so I'm, I'm st there we go. Um, so let's see if we can get that up and then let's see if I can do that. So now, to, before I introduce... Um, Gemma Pearson, who's our, our first uh, speaker tonight, um, we have a poll question for you. Um, the, very simple, as I've said earlier, this is not a, quest, a, a test of anyone's knowledge or anything like that, but have you ever struggled to overcome a behavioural issue with your horse? And we've got a series of options there from, yes, we have a few issues that we're working on, to now I've always managed to resolve things early before they become an issue. So it's just to get, begin to get a feel. Whilst you're answering that, I just uh, wanted to do a very um, quick introduction to World Horse Welfare, um, if I can get that. There we go. Um, many of you will be familiar with the work of World Horse Welfare, um, and uh, we work across the, in, currently in 16 countries outside Europe, um, and very much at the heart of what World Horse Welfare is about is to support the horse-human partnership in all its different guises and of course that's whether it be for sport and leisure or as a working animal or as a farm animal but also in other areas increasingly like animals used in equines used in therapy um, in terms of our outreach and our work you know education is very much at the heart of what we do like so many of our sister charities and that's very much what tonight's um, webinars are all about to help us as horse owners sort of uh, become better horse owners basically because we're all always learning and today's topic is all about understanding horses behavior and how they learn now if you joined us two weeks ago uh, you'll have heard Sue Dyson talk about how we can understand better 
um, the, 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 what horses are telling us in terms of when they're in, uh, in pain or in distress. So our understanding of our horsemanship is a really evolving area. And of course, our experience and our, our long term understanding with horses is so important. But it's also for us to better to understand what they're saying to us. And that's why I'm so pleased that Gemma's with us tonight um, and who can give us some really practical tips. And we've also joined uh, along with Gemma, we've got Claire Dickey, who's the centre manager for our Somerset Rescue and Rehabilitation Centre. So before I introduce um, Gemma formally, um, hopefully uh, Basil will be able to give us some results um, on the poll. Um, and look at that. So, you know, the, the majority, 30 percent, yes, <laughs> and half, we have managed to work it th through it. So a, a majority of you have had to overcome behavioral issues. Uh, but encouragingly, um, d d at the top 25 uh, percent, we've had a, a few issues that we're working on. So a good spread. But clearly what these results show is that behavioral issues aren't in the minority of horses. They are in the majority of horses. And that's very much, I'm sure, what we'll, we'll, we'll touch on during Gemma's presentation, who's going to speak first and then Claire and then after that we will get into um, a, a, a great Q&A and that's where we really rely on you um, as people joining us tonight to be able to send in those questions. So thank you for that and getting involved. Um, I'm now assuming I can get the system to work is to introduce Gemma who's um, very well known to the charity. Uh, she is as we speak writing up on her PhD, which is investigating the stress response of horses undergoing veterinary treatment with a plan to develop low stress handling techniques. And you can imagine actually when horses come into contact with vets, sometimes with, with challenging uh, techniques to uh, undertake, even, but even if it's as simple as ha having a vaccination, can be real, real challenges around that. So that's going to be hugely worthwhile. Um, in her spare time, Gemma helps her partner run an Arabian stud and competed up to advanced level at endurance on a home red horse she also enjoys competing in dressage and eventing so just a little bit of show jumping to go and she'll complete the uh, the, the, the full house so Gemma it, thank you very much I know you've recently taken on a role with the horse trust a charity obviously that we work very closely with and are great friends with I really want to thank you for taking the time to join us this evening I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over to you Gemma super thank you very much really I'm just setting this up. Perfect. So hopefully everyone can see and hear me okay. Uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me. So I really want to look at the principles of horse behaviour and training so we can set ourselves up for success. And what does success look like? Success is going to look very differently to different people, different horses. They're going to have different goals. But what I can tell you is all the horses um, that are in these pictures, despite having many different roles, are all involved with, are owned or cared for by people that are involved with the International Society for Equitation Science. So they are all cared for and trained based on the principles of training. Um, and on the IC's website, there's some, a really nice poster and some more text regarding the first principles of training. And if we apply these tr principles, we shouldn't really come across any significant behaviour problems. Later on, I'll come across what, what might happen or what we can do when it goes wrong. But we'll have a look through these. Obviously, given the time, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. I'm just going to pick out some of the bits that I think you might find useful. And I wanted to have a bit of a theme. So I thought it may be that you have a young horse at home that has a, a nice trot. You watch him move around the field. And you want to turn him into a Grand Prix dressage horse. And you want to get a 10 for your extended trot. But where do you start? Well, before we even think about training the horse, we need to think about meeting the horse's basic needs. And I'm really referring here to the horse's ethological needs. These are things which horses are hardwired to require. So horses need friends. They need social interaction with other horses. The top two pictures here are actually taken from the Swiss National Stud. They have a scheme now whereby over winter when there are no mares around, the stallions are all turned out together. Um, and then over summer when they are covering mares, obviously that's, that's not feasible. So they develop social housing 
So these stallions are still able to interact, to groom, to play with each other um, and to graze next to each other. Horses also need forage. Horses will normally eat for around 16 hours a day and they have a psychological need to chew as much as a nutritional requirement. And then they need freedom. Horses need to be able to move and choose how they move, whether that's to run, to book or to play. I'm sure given the year we've had in 2020, lots of people will understand that being restricted in your social interactions and your freedom of movement can be really stressful. Personally, I can't say that I've restricted the amount I'm eating, um, but the other two have certainly can cause problems for many of us. So we've put our horse in a nice environment. The next thing that we need to think about is to train easy to discriminate signals. Horses have a very limited mental capacity. And that's not to say they're not intelligent, but they learn in a slightly different way than we might think. So we want to make everything as easy as possible for them to get the right answer. Obviously, your riding position, how well balanced you are, how you move with the horse is really important. But ultimately, we're going to start teaching young horses using cues from our hands and from our legs. And horses aren't born with a, a set of instructions on how to be ridden, on how, what things work. So how can we make it easy? Well, a simple thing is if you want your horse to go faster, and that might be from a, a, fa a slow trot to a faster trot, or even from walk to trot, you can squeeze with your calf and hold that squeeze for two steps. And then when you want your horse to take longer steps or longer strides, you can give them a tiny tap with your heel and you can do that every third stride. That means that you're targeting a different foreleg each time you tap and that can be the signal for longer. And it's little things like this that can make a massive difference to horses. So if we teach each response independently, and make it very obvious to the horse what it is that we want, we can then start to put different aspects of that together. So if you teach your horse to go faster and slower and longer and shorter, and then you start to say, well, I want you to take shorter steps, but I'm going to ask for a little bit faster, and you've played around them, you can then start to get higher steps and build up towards PF and passage. And the next principle is that we need to train using learning theory. Learning theory describes the processes through which any animal learns. And I think a really important point is that you get the behaviour you reinforce, not the behaviour you want. So how can we train horses? There's basically two ways in which we can reinforce behaviour. The first one is positive reinforcement. Positive means the addition reinforcement to reward the correct behaviour. And positive reinforcement is used internationally um, in, in zoos. It's used with great success to train animals to be compliant in veterinary treatment. Lots of vets are now starting to use it for training horses to be compliant for veterinary treatment as well, again with a lot of success. But you can also use it for performance. Um, BZ Maddens, obviously an international show jumper, and she used it with her horses. She initially had one horse which was scared of the water tray. So she used that to help train him to overcome his fear of the water tray. But then she realised that doing a bit of positive reinforcement training with the horses, they were happier, they were doing really well. So she now uses positive reinforcement, mainly clicker training, to teach the horse how to make the correct shape over a jump. And she thinks that her horses try harder because they've been rewarded. And I mean, what is the extent to where we can go with positive reinforcement training? Well, if you were to look at, um, I've already said all the zoos use it, and you may say, well, that's very easy if you have a tiger or a, a monkey, something that's very intelligent. But one of the problems they have in zoos is that the coral is kept in still water. Coral's designed to be in moving water. And because of this, it can get algae growing on it. So they do have a fish, which they can put in, which eats the algae. But the problem is they then have to move that fish from tank to tank. And of course the fish sees the net coming, it's scared of the net, so it goes and it hides in the coral. And then you end up damaging the coral that you put the fish in to protect in the first place. So what London Zoo did was they clicker trained, I say clicker, they used a light, but they used positive reinforcement 
to train the fish to swim into a measuring jug on cue, to wait in the bottom of the jug, and then they lift it up and they put it into the next tank. So one thing I'm going to challenge tonight is if we can teach a fish to do what we want on cue, maybe we can use positive reinforcement to teach our horses. Talk about the addition of something pleasant. What is pleasant to a horse? Food, definitely, and giving them a scratch. We know that giving horses a scratch around the wither region, where they start to twitch their upper lip and enjoy it, can lower their heart rate by up to 10 beats per minute. And I'm sure we all know horses which will work for a scratch. Maybe you scratch them around the bottom, and if you stop scratching, they move across for some more. What is not motivating for horses is to be patted. I don't. Th some horses mind it, some I don't think mind it. I think they often associate it with a break in training, but it is not innately reinforcing to horses. We don't see any change to them if we just pat them. And also telling them that they're good. Not only do they not understand English, but they don't really understand the concept of, of verbal um, praise. So telling them they're good probably doesn't have any effect unless you also give the horse a break or follow it with food. And then the other side of the coin is negative reinforcement. So this is removal of something to reward the correct behaviour. We think of it as pressure release. So it's really important with young horses that we teach them that when we use our legs they go forward, when we put pressure on the reins they stop, um, if we put pressure on with just one leg they can yield their hand quarters one way or the other and as soon as we put pressure on one rein they move over. This is a young horse that I was back in for one of my good friends Natalie Warren and we were teaching her to, to step sideways so you can see with young horses you have to make it really really obvious what the right answer is. So my right hand is out to the side and I want her to move her right foot. But as soon as she moves that foot, I immediately release the pressure on the rein. So she knows that that's the right answer. And then the next, the final picture is a different horse. This is my own horse when she'd probably been under saddle for five months. And we have to use less movement with the hand. And over time it becomes more and more discreet. So going back to our horse that we're wanting to teach a nice medium trot to, then we can use the leg, but as soon as the horse starts to offer length and stride, we have to stop using the leg, because that's what motivates, so the pressure motivates the horse to lengthen the strides, but stopping using the leg teaches them that that was the correct response. If you keep using the leg, the horse will think, well, lengthening is obviously the wrong answer, and they then start to search for something else. So people often say to me, is positive or negative reinforcement better? And I would say that's like asking me whether I prefer wine or chocolate. I like both of them. And actually I like both of them in combination and copious amounts. So something else I'd suggest is that we use combined reinforcement, both for dealing with problems, for handling horses on the ground, and also for riding them. So I'll show you this video of a horse that's difficult for our medication. Now the first part is actually negative reinforcement. This horse is learning that when the syringe makes contact with his mouth, if he throws his head up, the syringe goes away. So he's not being difficult, we are training the wrong response. So to train the right response, I put the syringe somewhere easier. And then because his head was still, I removed it. That's the negative reinforcement part of it. This horse had never heard a clicker before. But now he's starting to realise, as soon as he hears the click, it's followed by food. So again, before this horse would think that the only way to make the syringe go away from his lips was to throw his head in the air. That was the behaviour we were reinforcing. Now he realises that to make the syringe go away from his lips, he stands calm and relaxed. And not only does it go away, but he also gets rewarded with some food. And then we can pop the syringe in, no problems. The next concept I want to think about is classical conditioning. So I said that when we want to teach a horse medium trot, 
we could tap it every third step with our heels and as soon as it starts lengthening its strides we stop tapping so we've made an easy to discriminate signal and we're going to stop giving the signal as soon as the horse lengthens so it knows it's the correct response but if i'm going to go to a dressage test i don't want to go across the diagonal line tapping my horse every three steps i want it to look harmonious i'm sure we're all aware of classical conditioning through pavlov's dogs he would ring a bell and then he would feed the dogs and eventually when he would ring the bell the dogs would start to salivate even though there was no food present so we can apply the same principle when you have a young horse you can tap every three steps um, and as soon as they get that they start lengthening you stop tapping and then what you can start to do is give a postural cue and give the postural cue and then start tapping horse lengthens stop tapping postural cue tap lengthen stop tapping postural cue horse lengthens they start to predict what will happen next and this is where your dressage test can start to look really nice and harmonious it looks like you have invisible aids and of course we also need to shape the behavior carefully we need to break it down into easy to achieve steps if you want a horse to be bold and jump around a large cross-country course you don't start with a big scary jump like the one in the bottom right hand corner you might start with a tiny little cross pole and then you build it up and gradually you make the question you're asking the horse more difficult. And I think we need to do exactly the same when we're training any aspect of what we're doing with horses. So this is a shaping scale that was designed by Equitation Science International. Again, they have some great things if you want more information. And we already have the scales of training but the only thing I'd say is I think they miss out the really bottom bit and that's the kind of basic attempt obedience level so let's go back to our young horse we want to teach it medium trot the first thing is we tap every third step with our heels the horse knows that's different to going faster as soon as it lengthens we stop tapping we've achieved basic attempt hopefully after a few repetitions the horse knows what the right answer is so as soon as you go to start tapping or as soon as you give the postural cue maybe even they immediately start lengthening their strides that's what we would say was obedience now at this point I don't mind if my horse is poking their nose out all I want is them to understand the concept to go longer and then I might say well you want to lengthen your strides but I want you to keep lengthening them until I give you another cue to do something different so the horse goes into starts lengthening its strides you stop you um, stop tapping the horse shortens so you tap again it lengthens you stop tapping and very quickly if you do that horses will offer more and more and more longer strides um, and then you can start to say you offered three or four now you offered seven now you offered ten so we'll ask you to come back to walk or ask you to shorten them again so we start to build the rhythm then I start to get more fussy about the horse being straight and being where I want it to be in the arena and then I start to worry about the contact and the outline of the horse if you do that too early it's too hard for the horse to give the right answer you end up saying go longer but put your head in which is often a slower signal and don't you know fall out through your shoulder and don't do this so just make it really easy and once you've got that and you're starting to make transitions between kind of longer uh, medium trot and collective trot then you start to build the engagement and everything's looking harmonious and pretty and then we start to go to proof level so we want to be able to do this in lots of different environments not just your own arena at home because this then makes it easier for when you're in the test for the horse to understand what length and strides is regardless of where you are so I've talked about how to make things successful but what if something goes wrong and this is a really common scenario small person fairly large horse and the horse swings away from the mountain block you know and whenever we talk to people with things like this they will often say I want to how do I stop the horse from swinging away well do you remember what I said before you get the behavior you reinforce not the one you want so rather than thinking about stopping the horse swinging away maybe we should think about training him to stand still or moving his quarters towards us even but there are a few things we need to consider as well what is the unwanted behavior a lot of people say not standing still 
but be more specific. For this horse, it is swinging the hindquarters to the right when he approaches the mountain block. But what motivates that behaviour? Is it pain? Um, I'm very aware that Sue Dyson gave an excellent talk a couple of weeks ago, and I would strongly recommend anyone that hasn't goes back and watches it, because pain is a component of by far the vast majority, I'd say 89%, 80-90% of behaviour cases I see, pain is a problem with. Um, are its basic ethological needs not being met? Is this horse just chronically stressed? Or is it a training error? And for this purpose of this video, it, it, it's a training error. So how can we then reinforce the behaviour we want? If the wrong behaviour is swinging the hindquarters to the right when they see the mountain block, we just need to train them, swing them to the left um, on cue. But we're going to shape that behaviour carefully. We're going to make it so easy for this horse to give the correct response. So we start off using the, the whip to ask the horse to yield the hindquarters to the right, being on the same side. So we're using negative reinforcement, removal reinforcement. I put the horse against the wall. Makes it easy for the horse to swing its hindquarters left and not swing them away from me. Notice as soon as the horse yields the hindquarters, we stop tapping. I actually give him a little scratch as well. And I want you to think about the amount of pressure I use with the stick. Because if the horse isn't responding to that amount of pressure, there's probably something else you're missing. You never want to go to more pressure than that. So we've practiced it away in the arena. We're now going to practice it at the mountain block. And I took the horse at 90 degrees. Tap. As soon as he makes any attempt, stop tapping. I'm not looking for perfection. I want him to achieve success. And I think, do you know that was a really good effort? So we're then walking around a big circle. We go, yep, yeah, that was right. Let's walk you away and give you a, you know, 10 second break walking around. Now look. Through classical conditioning, we lift the stick up and he starts to move the hindquarters over before I don't even have to tap him. It's not perfect, he's still fidgeting, but I've probably been working with this horse for about 15 minutes at this point. And we can introduce some food as well, a bit of positive reinforcement for standing still at the mountain block. And then at the end of the session, his owner can work with him. And again, it's not perfect. You know, she picks the reins up and it still cues a little fidget. But this horse had six months of swinging away from the block. And they tried, of course, you know, having people stood on his right hand side to stop him swinging. But you can see he's a big horse. He just knocked them out of the way quite easily. Um, and from there, we then just say, OK, we hop off again. And we repeat that. And the first time you ride him, you may get on, do that a couple of times, hop off, move round until eventually it's just habit. So there are no bad horses. There are lots of horses where pain is causing problems. There are lots in not great environments. And there are certainly lots of badly trained horses. So thank you very much. And does anyone have any questions? Although I think that's maybe after Claire's talk that we go to questions. Brilliant. Gemma, thank you very much. Cool. So much to, to think about there and um, l wonderful practical examples. And the first time I think we've ever had video on uh, on one of our Wednesday webinars. So excellent, but really good examples. So thank you for that. Yes, we will hold the questions. Uh, I noted uh, some have started to come through, but do please keep them coming through because um, we'll, we will have some decent time in a second. So um, what I will do before I'm going to introduce Claire, what I'm going to do um, is share my screen again. Um, and uh, there we go. Um, and then we'll just go back and we're going to ask a, a second poll question. Um, so again, the, no, no right and wrong answers, but do you feel confident um, in trying out different learning and training techniques with your horse and, and we've got an, a number of uh, a couple of yes options a couple of no options and a sort of in the middle so um, please just have a look at that and give um, that, that a, a, a go it, I should have said earlier unfortunately if you're on Facebook live you won't be able to, to answer the questions but do put them in the comment section but if you're on zoom then please answer that and then I'm going to introduce um, Claire next 
if I can move that on. There we go. Um, now, Claire you started life um, w with the charity a, many, a few years ago, I shouldn't say many, a few, and uh, started life at our Scottish Rescue and Re uh, Rehoming Centre, uh, went to our Norfolk Rescue and Rehoming Centre a short time away, and then has been centre manager for our centre down in Somerset, Glenderspooner Farm. Um, her pride and joy, so don't ask any nasty questions about Bruce, he's a beautiful, beautiful feathery cob type who can turn his hooves to pretty much anything but um, D D Claire does have a, a bit of a weak spot because she has so many dogs she absolutely adores her dogs and every time I visit Somerset unfortunately I haven't been able to do it since March um, uh, she there's another dog I dread to think how many dogs that there are since since March but maybe uh, that the current environment has limited her intake of dogs um, but she's she's obviously a really experienced centre manager for us and 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 um, done so many different roles so Claire it's brilliant to have you to be able to provide and I think you're giving us a case example to start with and then a few other sort of um, experiences of what we, we kind of situations we deal with at World Horse Welfare so Claire the floor is yours. Hi Rowling yeah thank you very much uh, down to three dogs oh just, just so you're aware um, okay yeah hello everybody now um, I need to share my screen Am I there? You are there. Oh, you just need to get it onto presentation view, I think. If, um... yeah. Brilliant. You're good Yay. to go. There we are. First achievement of the evening. Fabulous. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm going to talk to you this evening um, about Chelsea, one of um, a group of horses that, that came into us uh, completely feral um, last year. But before I get down to the details, of how we rehabilitated Chelsea and the other horses she came in with. Um, Basil is actually going to show us a short film uh, that will give you a bit of an idea about her background, uh, where the horses came from, and, and really what, what our starting point was. Through our work in the UK, World Horse Welfare often encounters horses who have negative partnerships with people or no partnership at all. One such case involved a large group of horses residing next to the M25. Lots of different agencies have been involved in trying to resolve issues there over the years, um, but never really been that successful, mostly due to the land and the difficulty of the animals that are there, really. The location held over 100 horses alongside other farm animals which had been turned out into fields or kept in dark sheds with very little in the way of human contact. I mean these horses were living in a large herd um, with active stallions so you've got sort of groups split between stallions of foals and mares, youngsters. Um, and when they're living like that, I mean, they're flight animals anyway, so anything that frightens them, they're, they're really, their instinct is to run away. Um, but they will also sort of run through or over anything to get away from the thing that they're frightened of. And these are 16 hand horses. They're big, they're sort of thoroughbred hackney crosses. They're highly strung, really motivated um, by fear. Um, and those, the environment that they lived in just exasperated that behaviour to the point where it was, you know, it was really prolific. World Horse Welfare and other agencies worked with the owners who were struggling to cope. After many, many years of breeding horses and cattle, they've suddenly realised that it's actually getting out of control for them and, and they're not really able to give them the care that they need. Um, so, you know, it was really a case of, of trying to work with them to resolve the problems rather than anything else. Over 100 horses were signed over to the care of charities and removed from the site. Some of them were taken to World Horse Welfare Glenda Spooner Farm, where the team were able to start building the foundations of a positive partnership with each of them. Hey. 
Thank you very much, Gravel. That was absolutely great. So um, the aim really for us at the start of our rehabilitation is to gain the trust of these horses. You know, ultimately, we hope to be able to rehome the animals as a, a ridden prospects, ridden or driven horses. Um, but of course, right at the very start, we're dealing with horses that have been, you know, suffering from a chronic lack of care. And the first thing we need to teach them is how to comply with us for you know, their basic husbandry needs and, and veterinary needs. And any assessment about their future use is, is way, way, way off down the line. So really the, the first thing we're trying to achieve is to teach the horse to work with us in a way that he can understand and enjoy. So on arrival, the, the critical thing for us is to minimize stress for these horses. They've never been handled, um, and then suddenly someone comes in and rounds them up and puts them on a transporter, um, and they arrive in a completely alien environment. And of course, we understand as horse owners, any move to a different yard, any form of transport can be stressful, even for a horse that's been well handled. So for, for these horses, that it's a, a massive deal um, that they've had to, that they've been relocated. Um, so while the temptation for us is to want to rush in and deal with the long feet and the parasite burdens, actually it's really important that we just um, stay hands off, at least for the first couple of days, so visual checks only, and we will only intervene immediately if it's absolutely necessary. So for horses injured or, or poorly, we have no choice, and of course we have to intervene, but otherwise our choice would always be to just give the horses a chance to, to settle in first and allow their adrenaline just to come back down. Um, we do have a crush and some holding pens on site. Uh, so if we do have no choice but to intervene immediately in an emergency situation, we have this facility um, which keeps the horse much safer, it keeps our vets, our farrier and our staff much safer. Um, it's never going to be our first choice of, of action. We would much prefer to let the horses settle in and go through a, a handling training program to allow them to understand what's going on. Uh, but this piece of kit, we don't use it very often. When we use it, it's, it's absolutely fabulous. It's worth, it, it's worth its um, investment. Um, sometimes we know in advance we're going to need to use it. So for example, if we've you know, got an, an, an older feral horse that clearly has dental issues, that's going to need to be addressed before we've got to the stage where we can properly head collar train the horse and teach it everything it's gonna to need to know. Um, but what we can do is teach the horse to use the crush. Um, so for a few days prior to any veterinary or dental treatment, we can just wander the horse through um, loose, following a trail of, of food or pony knots, a big jackpot of pony nuts in the crush and they're straight out the front again. So that process of going into the crush in itself um, isn't a, a stressful or worrying event for the horse. So as I said um, previously on arrival, it's settling in time for at least the first few days. It's really important that we allow the horse's adrenaline just to come down. Um, they obviously need to rehydrate They've, they're obviously very hungry, they're underweight when they come to us. And these horses are about to embark on a huge learning journey with us. And they're, they're like us, if they're stressed, tired, hungry, thirsty, worried about something, they're just not gonna be able to learn. It's not gonna be productive for them. We're just going to induce more stress. And you can see from the image here, the, the group that came in, these are all mares with young foals at foot. Um, so it's doubly, doubly important that we don't stress these ladies out. They're very, very busy also being mums. Um, after the first few days of settling in where we're really hands off, um, we just start to begin to introduce ourselves to the horses. Or as we like to describe it, we introduce the horse to the idea of the value of a pony nut. Um, so most of the horses that have lived this feral existence, have never experienced hard feed, they don't know what a pony nut is, they've probably never seen a feed bowl till they've been rounded up, um, and we just want 
to start to help the horses to make a positive association when they see a person. And we do this by, we just have a, a line of bowls, a handful of pony knots in each bowl, and we just pop them under the fence um, and back away to whatever distance is necessary to give the horses enough space to just come and investigate those bowls by themselves. And uh, we repeat that, uh, you know, a couple of times a day for a few days and the horses start to recognize that they see us coming and this amazing food they've never experienced before, this amazing jackpot bonus arrives and they start to anticipate that and wander in our general direction when they see us arrive. And that really is the, the critical first step. And then we will build on that by just remaining a little bit closer to the bowls as the horses investigate them with the, the eventual progression being able to hold the bowl while the horse approaches and has the pony nut and eventually the horse having enough confidence to just come and take a pony knot from our hand. As demonstrated by beautiful Chelsea um, with Emily here, the, if, considering these horses were absolutely terrified and would run in the opposite direction when they saw a person, uh, this amount of progress is just incredible. Um, and we normally find that we can achieve this normally within a couple of weeks if we just stay hands off with with no stress at all. But of course, we want to progress from here. What we don't want to teach the horse is that he can run in, stand at arm's length away directly in front of us, grab a pony knot and, um, and leg it. Um, uh, just a small health and safety note here. Um, the type of, of horses that we were working with with this particular group, um, we'd assessed and risk assessed their behavior and um, decided that it was perfectly um, acceptable, perfectly reasonable to proceed with this course of action. Um, there are lots of cases where going in to a big group of horses carrying multiple bowls of pony nuts is not going to be the safe or appropriate uh, course of action. Um, we have the benefit of CCTV over our isolation paddocks, so we already have a pretty good idea of herd dynamics if there's a particularly confident or quite a buzzy personality in the group we've got the facilities with our holding pens to remove certain individuals or reduce numbers that we work with in the paddock um, and we can play around a little bit with herd dynamics by um, including maybe one or two calmer well handled horses um, but we have to make use of all of the resources that we have available um, if a horse is going to be particularly um, over the top or over enthusiastic um, and try and skittle people out of the way and steal the pony nut. So what we want to achieve is um, building this towards this behaviour rather than standing head on and taking a pony nut and running away. What we're teaching Chelsea to do is to come and stand in our space calmly with a handler at her side. Um, so we would reward this behavior and once Chelsea can stand calmly um, Emily's going to start to introduce the idea of touch um, bearing in mind these horses have probably never had a human hand on them uh, touch the first couple of times can surprise them but generally these horses coats and skin are in fairly poor condition they often usually have lice um, and they're pretty itchy so we, that's a brilliant bonus for us at this stage. If we start some um, wither rubbing or neck rubbing and give them a good scratch, they realize really quickly that um, touch from a human is a really positive and really re a reinforcing thing. And at that stage, we can start to use touch as a reward and reduce the amount of food reward. So we're saving our pony nuts for teaching new behaviors or re reinforcing things that are a little bit more difficult and just standing beside us in the field is something they get a nice scratchy fuss for instead. And from this position, we will work towards eventually introducing the head collar. And it's really important that we break down every tiny increment involved in putting a head collar on. It sounds so simple. Uh, Well-handled horses accept it so readily. But actually, the horse has to understand that we're going to stand on his left, but touch the right side of his face and move our arms in a strange way around his ears, around his eyes and touch him over the top of his head. So before we ever introduce the head collar, we'll um, 
touch the horse all over his face, rewarding every time the horse stands still, uh, rewarding every time he naturally turns his or head, her head towards us. And when we pop the head collar on for the first time, it's put it on, reward, take it off. So we're not putting the head collar on with any uh, initial intention of trying to control or restrain the horse. We're teaching the horse the head collar goes on, it comes off, it's no big deal, it doesn't matter. Um, and by reinforcing this very, very, very early on, we've produced horses that ordinarily are very pleased to see us and very pleased uh, to accept the head collar and will voluntarily pop their nose in, um, expecting a, a nice reward rather than trying to evade the head collar by associating it with something else. Now, once we've got our horse's head collar trained enough to be able to be um, properly vet checked and have their feet sorted out, um, that's obviously the, the very first priority, parasite management, dental treatment, all that sort of thing. Um, and again, broken down incrementally as, as best as we can, we fully expect there's gonna be some procedures that the horses will have to be sedated for. Um, but those eagle-eyed of you will have noticed already that Chelsea has a rather large lump on her side, which is in fact a hernia. Um, and we also discovered on Chelsea's vet check that she was also, even though she's only two years old, rising free, um, in fact, pregnant. Um, so we um, continued with her handling, teaching her as much uh, basic handling as we could before the arrival of her baby, monitoring obviously her physical condition, but also her mental, emotional progress. She's learning lots of new skills and at the start of lockdown, she produced a little sweetie. This is Buena, a little filly. Um, and we were very relieved. Um, not only was Chelsea's hernia absolutely fine through her pregnancy and, and her birth, uh, but that we'd also managed to get so much handling done with Chelsea because she was not a natural mum. And the first certainly 12 to 24 hours, she really struggled having a new baby. I think she's only a baby herself and she just didn't really understand what to do with this small, damp, wriggly creature. Um, and we did have to intervene and, and assist her. And of course, if, she, if she'd not had the benefit of all of that handling and all of that positive association with humans, we could, by intervening, have actually made the situation far worse and ended up um, having to hand rear a foal. Here she is out in the field for the first time. Extra picture really just because she's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and progress report now, Buena um, is now in fact weaned. Um, having the benefit of being born here and being super cute means that she's been well handled right from birth um, and is in fact now ready for a new home. And I think subject to all the relevant checks is in fact, um, hopefully off to a new home before Christmas. Um, we aim to rehome every horse that comes into our centre. Um, these are on a permanent loan basis, but we always um, retain ownership. So there is a safety net there for, for any horse. So you know, for Buena, who was born in our care, she'll be protected by the cover of the charity for her whole life. Although we very much hope that she'll be building a bond with her, you know, with her own rehomer that will last a lifetime. Um, and Chelsea is going to be referred for a hernia repair now that she's no longer having to be a mum. Thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I'll be intrigued to know who 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 named the, the foal Buena. I love I love the name, um, but uh, that was great. And apologies for the video at the start. I don't know if everyone had, but that wasn't the the security services taking out part of the video. I think it was just the way it was it was uh, playing through. But um, hopefully it got uh, got the message across and where um, um, uh, uh, that that over a hundred animals were, were rescued by. A partnership of charities which is great and Buena is, is a result of that and that's a, a great ha happy story so thank you for that now thank you very much for all the questions that are coming through please do keep them coming on the comments function for Facebook and on the Q&A function for um, 
for uh, Zoom. Um, so kicking off, um, Gemma, in, uh, in, uh, Sally Ann's asked, in the mountain block example, uh, you didn't increase, you talked about not increasing the pressure if, it, if the horse is not responding. You said the raw, if the horse didn't respond, it possibly because there's another reason. What could the other reason be and what would we do instead of pressure increase? Yeah, so I guess, obviously, is it because the horse is not calm and confident in that environment? If the horse is distracted by other things, um, if they're not confident with handling generally, it could be that. If the horse is in pain or discomfort, they may be less motivated to move in a certain way. Um, what I would do if the horse, you know, if I thought I'd set everything up for success and the horse still wasn't moving, is I would maybe start tapping a little bit lower down on the leg and watch the horse and watch their reactions you know if the horse is just kind of watching the butterflies go past then you yeah that's when you tap a little bit lower maybe a little bit faster whereas if you can see the horse just that tiny bit of tension that little bit of focus you know that they can feel it they're motivated to do something but they don't know what the right answer is so just give them time and even if they start to shift their way before they move, stop tapping and scratch them. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm, I'm so sorry. In, in, in the excitement of introducing Claire, I never actually went back to the poll question and, and gave you the answers to that. So before we go to the next um, uh, answer, I thought we'd, let's just bring up the, the, the poll question. Do you feel confident trying out different learning and training techniques with your horse? And that's great. 40% oh, of people saying, yes, I'm always looking online and reading books. So that's brilliant. 22% um, yes, with the support of a professional. And, and then obviously, sort of, I'm 32% saying I, I read about different approaches, but I'm not always sure how best to introduce a new method. So hopefully, certainly to everyone there that, that what we're talking about tonight is relevant. Um, a question for you, Claire. Someone's asked, um, uh, so Anne's asked, could you please comment on the importance of the rider and handler's own body language and emotional state when working with horses? Um, so from a world horse welfare perspective, what, what, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I think there's been so much focus on um, human emotional state recently obviously horses read us probably better than we read each other and um, i know my horse knows how i feel and reflects back back to me before sometimes i've even recognized and it, it's absolutely critical that you focus 100 percent on low heart rate um not going in with an agenda just to um work through whatever the task is at the horse's pace and certainly from our perspective it's about setting everything up right for the horse rather than going in focusing on what we want to achieve yeah brilliant um Quite a few questions, um, Gemma, coming in about travelling. Um, and uh, so Eva's the, f the first one I've, I've come across here. How would you best approach training a young horse to travel by himself? He's good to load and travels OK with another horse, but he's still a bit anxious. There might be times when he needs to go on his own. And, and how, how would you break things down to make it stress-free as possible? Yeah, so uh, practice, practice, practice um, is the thing, really, and make it as positive for them as possible. So I think she'd said that she he was used to traveling with another horse. I think that's the best thing you can do, get them used to that. But then it may be that you've been to a competition with your other horse um, and you leave the trailer out and he goes in and just gets a bit of feed and then comes out again. And then you even get him used to going in, having some feed, maybe a net with some carrots in it or something whilst the trailer sh you know, just shut up. Again, you might not shut it all up initially, um, but just seeing what he copes with. And if he continues to eat while everything's shut up, that's fine. Next time you might just do a, a short journey around the yard or around the block and take him out again. So just break it down into easier to achieve steps and make it as positive as possible for him to be in that trailer. And Claire, quite a few questions about horses that are difficult to load. They've had a bad experience. And I imagine at the charity, there's there's plenty of horses. We might get them to the centre, but trying to get them, you know, when we rehome them, we're always obviously trying to make them safe to travel um, and good to travel. Uh, what what uh, sort of tips can, can, can you provide for what, those who have had bad experiences and are bad at loading? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just echoing what, what Gemma's just said, really breaking it down into absolutely tiny minuscule uh, pieces 
Um, so when we're preparing horses to load and travel, um, we will familiarise them with walking on and off all sorts of different things because obviously they have to step onto a ramp. So stepping on and off a curb, walking over a tarpaulin, changing surfaces, walking over a piece of rubber matting, all that sort of stuff um, suggests the idea to the horse that he's going to step onto something. And um, going through doorways, you know, even even things like um, stopping midway through your stable door is a is a great precursor to going into that entrance um, of the trailer. Um, we've, we're really fortunate. We've got a trailer that has uh, front and rear load. So when they first start to go on, they just go on, they walk through, they come out, they get present. Um, and, and build that up um, super, super, super slowly. Um, yeah. It's again, be, you know, the, the horse dictates when he's ready to move on to the, to the next step. And certainly things uh, like having a travel body, making the trailer really reinforcing. And we had a horse, I think we fed in the trailer for about three weeks every day. He went in, he had dinner, he came out. Um, and he got to the stage, he's dragging us to the trailer then he's ready for the next step. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And actually, did just but Alana to mention it to me, we did do a, a transport webinar um, earlier on, I think it was in September. So please go on to our YouTube channel and, and there's a really good um, discussion there around transporting. Um, quick question, just side, but not, not really anything to do with now. How, um, Marianne's asked Claire, how do, you, how do you separate the mare and foal and at what age? So um, Gwenna and uh, Chelsea lived in a mixed group um, we, uh, within a few days of the foal being born, we started to consider who weaning bodies should be for both mum and baby. Um, so we introduced, you know, a, a small, a small mixed group, um, and to a certain degree, let the mare and foal uh, dictate the speed. But as they, you know, as we start to bring them in for handling, bring them in, mum with her friend and baby with her friend, um, standing in stables opposite. Uh, and, and bringing mare away for just a minute at, at a time, bringing foal away for a minute at a time. Um, it's, a, it's a very gradual process. Um, I'm really relaxed, I'm super relaxed about weaning, especially with fillies, if they want to stay with mum until they're seven, eight, nine months old, um, providing that's not causing mum any medical issues. Um, yeah, super happy with that. And I don't think Brenna and Chelsea even noticed when they were separated, they'd done so much uh, preparatory work that, that I think mum mum came in and had a feet trend and went out to a different field with her friend and yeah never noticed uh, baby wasn't there. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, certainly that's coming through. And Jeremy, you've talked about it several times. You know, it's patience, it's time. The, the, it's not cutting corners. It's just taking a. Um, Gemma, um, someone's asking about. Uh, when I give a food reward from a pocket or using a lick, the horse can come a bit nosy or what you might describe as bargy if the lick is taken away. Have you had this experience and how would you recommend tackling this behaviour? Yeah, so you remember the slide that was twice in my presentation. You get the behaviour you reinforce, not the one you want. So when I start introducing food around horses, I'm training with food. I teach them to look away for food. So the behavior of looking away is what results in getting the food. So that's the habit that is formed. They don't mug you. They don't start pushing into you. But even more than that, I don't just want them to look away. I want them to look away and be calm and relaxed to have that nice, low emotional state. Um, and for some horses, and this is very relevant to the charities, actually, if you take a horse that has been starved, food is more motivating to that horse than it may be to a horse that has never been starved. So in even horses that have never been starved, particularly the native types, food can be highly motivating for them. So rather than using carrots or polos or even nuts, we'll often use chaff with some of these horses. Some of them just the most boring dry hay, they will work really hard for it. So monitor your horse's emotional state and if they're getting too excited, use something less exciting and always reinforce when the horse is offering the behavior you want not the one you don't want brilliant um claire so someone's asked on facebook um someone's they've just started helping at a pony and horse rescue which is brilliant and working with ponies and horses with unknown histories and with varying issues clearly what we do as well what's the best way to approach a horse or pony with an unknown background uh, having potentially been subjected to abuse oh crikey carefully 
<laughs> carefully in the in the first instance that really i mean the the every single horse is different um a good understanding of horse body language is absolutely essential um obviously they're flight animals so approaching that horse where he's got room to move away from you is going to be much much safer than approaching him in, a, in an area where he's cornered where if he does feel frightened his only choice is potentially to try and hoof you out of the way um but every horse is, is so different um yeah. body language really is is what's going to keep you and him safe brilliant thank you Gemma. i i, I feel my my 11 to welsh mountain, mountain pony here someone's asked on facebook my pony shows aggression towards all other horses regardless of her size she is 11 to she's even kicked us a, a shire she has to be kept in a sheep fence paddock to stop her, her breaking into other horses field it is not fear related or hormone related are there things i can do to help her be more chilled when the other horses are in view so uh, that's probably not something I can give a short answer to. Um, I think speaking to a behaviourist to find out lots of other things that are going on with that horse that might motivate those behaviours. If I was going to give a very quick answer, I would say to start to reward the behaviour you want. So if another horse comes into view and she's calm, her ears are forward, you click and you reward that um, until she starts to associate other horses being in proximity with something positive herself and not something she feels she has to defend it from. It's probably also worth saying, um, they are the sorts of things that I would try and get an accredited behaviourist on board. And the place to go realistically now for that is the Animal Behaviour and Training Council website. And they have lists of people who are accredited equine behaviourists, so you can find one near you that's a really good point and we'll, we'll certainly put that up in the, in the chat function because actually getting the right person and someone who's got the, the right training is, is so important it's a really good point thanks Gemma um uh, Claire Miriam's asked what would you advise doing of a horse that naps and rears when asked to go somewhere she resists e.g a stream with a small amount of water in it okay so again that's breaking breaking that right down um and as Gemma said rewarding every try re rewarding every effort uh, to be fair this is probably much more a Gemma a question um if i can pass that over that's certainly her area of expertise nicely done yeah so um if it's just a stream problem then fine we, we tackle that if she's nappy in lots of places i'd be getting the vet to check that there's not some pain underlying that because and i do see that a lot um, horses that are nappy that have pain problems but if it's just a stream then we have to teach them that if you use your leg they go forward and you remove your leg a lot of forward going horses people never use their leg and then as Claire said it's just a case of breaking it down into lots of really easy to achieve steps so when she's quite far away from the stream ask her to step towards it and maybe even halt her before she gets to it give her a nice scratch maybe back her up ask her to go closer until she gets really confident to walk right up to it and that's why sometimes having another horse stood if it's that small the stream even kind of straddling the stream or in it can really help them just to take that last step and we can use positive reinforcement as well you know you could reinforce her for stepping towards it and for sniffing at the stream and you can do that from ridden you can just obviously train it away from the stream but they realize that the click means food is coming you just lean forward and deliver it and then they get really confident wanting to go and, and play with the stream. They want to engage with it. And so Bishop, following on from that, Gemma, Chloe's asked, a horse can get too reliant on positive reinforcement, i.e. food, then stops responding if food is not present, but does not respond that well to negative reinforcement and does not, does not move on from pressure. How do you motivate this kind of horse? So, again, you get the behaviour you reinforce, not the one you want. Um, I've never seen a horse that stops responding to negative reinforcement. So I would look very carefully at how someone's using negative reinforcement, making sure they're releasing that pressure for the tiniest try to keep the horse motivated. And you can also get something, we talk about shaping the correct behavior. You can also get something called backward shaping. So you might shape the behavior for a horse to go 10 steps before it stops and gets food reward. And really, you then want to move that on to 12 and then 15 steps. But sometimes people, the horse stops at eight, so they reward that. And then the horse stops at six, so they reward that. And the horse ends up kind of dictating 
how much they offer before they get the reward. So turning, you need to turn that back on its head again. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Claire, Laura's asked, how long did it take to, to, from Chelsea arriving with you guys to you being able to get a head collar on her? Oh, no, the, the average, I, was, I thought this question might come up, the average for us, we would say, is probably two, two weeks, two to three weeks. Um, Chelsea was actually much quicker. She was a, an absolute poppet um, and, and such a super, super hard trier. Um, we've had horses before now take three, four, five months. Um, it's yeah. every single horse is different. And then just following on from that, um, uh, Gemma, we've had someone who's uh, recently bought an unhandled yearling and we have worked hard to build a relationship. Unfortunately, their, their head collar came off in the field. He's very intelligent and I tend to get one shot at, at, at getting it back on again. He's out 24-7, um, but she doesn't want to sort of break his trust. How, how can I get the head collar back on him? Yeah, so I think Claire covered this really nicely in the video, actually. Um, it's all about reinforcing that exact behavior. So often what happens is you're focusing on trying to get the head collar on this young horse. Whereas instead I would, can we reward him for standing calmly? And the click is really important here. Whether you use an actual clicker or the word yes, or doesn't matter what, but you've got to say that is the exact moment that I liked. That's going to follow food. So standing quietly, standing quietly while you're on the left of them, standing quietly while you lift your hands up and um, I then often get them to target the head collar so I'll lift it up and if they even just look at it think about sniffing at it click remove the head collar so we're using combined reinforcement and give the food and you'd be amazed how quickly they start putting their nose in at themselves mm. I have dealt with some horses um, which people have either never been able to get head collars on or one particular comes to mind that moved to a new premises and after two weeks, the owner could then not get near him. Um, and he was so quick to turn around because we trained him to want to target and to want to put his nose in the head collar. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, who's, who's asked that? Um, Karen uh, has asked, do we hold on to the passport when we rehome the horses? No, the passport goes with the horse uh, as it needs to. So, um, th th thank you. Um, Claire, you might want to hand this on to Gemma in a bit, but I just thought so there's a couple of questions here from Emma about separation anxiety. How do you deal with it uh, when you wish to take a lead horse away from the herd to spend time in the stable to be ridden? W what's our experience there? So yeah, absolutely, and um, um, off that's something we see reasonably often actually with with horses that come in. I'm sure Gemma will have lots to add, but it's a it's a it comes back to really what we've covered already. You know, breaking this down into tiny tiny increments, re removing the horse for you know so he's still in sight of his friends for just a few seconds, reward and go back, um, and and build that up. Um, but certainly that's something I'm going to also hand to Gemma. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you've covered the kind of key concept there. Um, I, I think separation anxiety is probably quite a complex thing. Um, so getting a behaviourist involved is really useful, but just making it a positive experience for them to be slightly away from the other horses, first of all, and build on that. Again, what I would also say is I have known horses which maybe were a little bit unsure about being away from other horses, but not bad, and then they get really bad separation anxiety they're really difficult and in all of think of these cases um we've had an underlying pain problem develop so kissing spines lameness and if you have any underlying pain or if there's stress in any aspect of your life that makes you more anxious about other aspects of your life that you might normally cope with so if your horse's behavior changes or something suddenly gets worse often looking at pain would be the, the first thing there and again you know the horse with kissing spines as soon as we treated that the separation anxiety resolved brilliant um claire so sonia's asked do foals need other foals or are they okay in a herd of adult horses um i think wherever possible it's really nice for foals to develop their social skills with a wide range of horses so if we've got more than one foal um, it's nice for them to be able to socialise together, assuming their mums get on. Um, that's also really, you know, really important. Um, but we certainly like our young horses to to learn to live, you know, and socialise with young horses, old horses, mares, geldings, um, 
you know, and give them a, a really good social skill set from the outset. But then I think the most important thing is if the adult horses are, are happy and calm um, and living in a harmonious herd, then it's a great environment for, for, for youngsters. Brilliant. Um, Gemma, just being asked by the team, can you just repeat where the, the, what the Professional Behaviourist Support website is? Yeah, I'd have a look on the Animal Behaviour and Training Council. Fine, brilliant, thank you. Um, interesting question here, Gemma. Uh, what's the thoughts of using a twitch? Does it reinforce bad behaviour? Uh, my mare was not injection friendly as a treatment and vet twitched uh, the, 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 by hand on the side of the neck and had an instant standstill response. Yeah, so I guess there's differences between different parts of the body where you twitch. Um, I will often grasp some skin on the neck before I, I give a horse their vaccine. Um, I think, first of all, if I can get hold of a lot of skin, it shows me the horse is nice and relaxed. And I think it can just help to kind of numb that, that area a little bit before we pop the needle in. And um, what I would never do is try and use that to restrain a horse. If a horse is fearful, um, you want to be training them to be confident to stand still. And you can do that really quite quickly. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and another one, um, d d d there's a few around the mountain block, so I'll just take this, d this one. Once stood at the mountain block, how can I get my horse to stand still? You get the behaviour you reinforce, not the one you want. So reinforce that behaviour of standing still. Um, you can use positive reinforcement training, you know, even just the word yes, or anything that's distinct. So you line the horse up, you say yes, you give it food. Um, I actually even just a couple of nights ago was dealing with a horse um, that has some pain. It has some possible back pain and some stifle pain. So we didn't use the negative reinforcement here. We wanted this horse to have choice. If she didn't want to stand at the mountain block, she could move away at any time. And this horse had been really quite anxious around the block and had booked when the rider had got on. So we just reinforced the behavior of standing at the block. And then we shaped it really carefully, whereby the owner would start to climb on the mountain block, say yes, give the food and come off again and building up to whereby the horse stood still, even as she touched the saddle and leant over and did things like that. But it was done in such tiny incremental steps. And if the horse did move off, we said, that's fine. That's your choice. We're not going to force you. Obviously, you don't then give the food reward. So you then give the horse, walk around a big circle, give them another opportunity and give them the choice again. Brilliant. Um, we've just put up that link um, for, the, for the, the um, training council there. So that's on both Facebook and, and on the chat function there. Um, there's quite a few questions around riding and I'll, I'll try and take a couple of those in a second. For Claire, um, how can I, Hannah's asked, how can I get a youngster to come in on her own? Sometimes if she doesn't want to come in, she will not budge even with treats. Um, thanks, Rayleigh. Yeah, I, I assume that means coming in away from, from her friends, field bodies. Um, yeah. And again, I think that's, that sounds like a separation potentially a separation anxiety. I mean, there could be multiple reasons why that behaviour could be going on. Um, if she can follow a friend in and get real confidence coming in, um, it, you know, there's, there's, there's so many things going on there. It's, it's pretty hard. To... Claire, I don't know if you've suddenly gone very quiet. Um, but I'm not sure if that's something on the, on, on the microphone, but th I think we just about got that, which is great. Um, so, um, can I, Gemma, there's quite a few around riding. Um, and so I'll just take a couple. My horse jig jogs home every, every ride. As soon as we get halfway, her attitude changes. We do lots of different rides. They're always varied. She's fit and healthy, saddle checked. She's brilliant on the ground in her saddle. But I've tried lots of natural horseman techniques, but I have not cracked it. What would you suggest? I would teach her to walk slowly and that sounds really simple and obvious but that is what I would do and um, there's a nice exercise that you can do I'd practice in arena first of all so practice that when you squeeze with your legs they do a fast walk and then when you just squeeze very gently with the reins for two steps they do a slow walk and build up to being able to do several steps a nice little exercise is um, to put your leg on for one two release as the horse is walking Another step or two and then hands for one, two, stop. So you only ever walk forward six steps. So it's go, stop, go, stop. And after a while, you'll ask the horse to go and they're barely moving because they know they're going to stop again after six steps. 
So then you make it eight steps and then you make it 10 and you get in this really slow. I mean, you would never do this in a dressage test. It looks horrendous, but this horse is really barely moving. Um, and then you can practice that out riding. And I would also practice the slow and the faster because what will happen is the horse won't go from being nice and calm and slow and then just start jogging. They'll just start to get that little bit more energy. And when they do that, say, I want you to just walk so slow, it looks horrendous. And if they just offer you two or three steps of that, go, that was brilliant, now walk faster again. Because that's what they want. And then you ask for a little bit slower again. And then when they offer that nice bit, a little bit faster. And just through playing with these transitions, the horse then maintains more focus on what you're asking. And you can just use your seat as a maintenance aid to keep the horse in whatever rhythm of walk you want. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. I'm, I'm seeing here, we've answered 15 questions and there's still 23 to come. We're, we're almost on time. Well, we are on time, but we're going to take a couple more. Thank you so much. Uh, one more on travel, um, Claire. How would you start? Would you start uh, by not tying your horse up to travel a short distance to make him feel less stressed? Um, again, I, I think that's... Can you lean right far? I'm not quite sure what's happened to your microphone there. It's ve you're very distant. Uh, I don't know what happened. Well, I, to see if you can play around with that. Um, there's there's, a, there's a, a few questions around positive reinforcement. There's one here. Um, someone talking about mixing um, positive and negative reinforcement and whether that is confusing to the horse, Gemma. Um, not in my experience. Um, I think... It really depends on what it is you're asking, what the exact scenario is. Um, but I think we're almost always using negative reinforcement anyway. So, yeah, if you teach a horse to target a cone or, you know, you're teaching them at liberty to go to something, that is entirely positive reinforcement based. But if we're riding them or even if we're leading them, we're often giving cues. Or if the horse is fearful of something and you're removing that, both are involved. So just being aware of it. Um, I think it's also good fairly earlier on if you're just using positive reinforcement training to mix it up. So sometimes the horse gets food, sometimes they get a scratch. So they're not always expecting food every single time, you know, they, they give the right response. Brilliant. Um, d Claire, uh, have you been able to do anything with your microphone? Uh, I'm not sure. Is that any better? I'm afraid it's not. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, one more question, Gemma, for you, and then I, we, we, we really should stop. Um, someone said, um, asked about the use of the voice and, um, you know, um, how important that is in terms of um, getting the right behaviours. Yeah, so the horse is, it doesn't mean anything to them whatsoever. We can classically condition the voice. So when I'm lunging my horses, I may say trot and then follow it up with the lunge whip. And then as soon as they go into trot, obviously the lunge whip um, drops down by my side again, or I may click and treat them for that. And very quickly I say trot and they trot because they know that is the, the correct response. But the voice in itself doesn't mean anything to horses. It's really important that they understand your hand and your leg pressure or physical pressure off the lead rope. If you're leading them, don't just try and say whoa or go or anything like that. Having said that, sometimes if people talk, they breathe better, so they're actually calmer themselves. So if you need to talk to help yourself maintain that, that degree of calmness, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you train a specific cue to a specific voice aid, that's fine. But otherwise, the voice doesn't really mean anything to horses. Brilliant. So I, I thought I'd just finish up by asking Claire and Gemma to, just for some final thoughts or take home messages. Claire, if you lean very close to your microphone and we all listen very carefully, um, we, we'll, we'll see if we could do this. So Claire, what, what, what are your take home messages? So I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can just hear you. Brilliant. So if you didn't hear that, it was about make, make the behaviour mean something. You've got to understand what you're trying, your horse is trying to tell you. And that's, the, you know, is the key message to take away from that. Thank you, Claire um, and Gemma. 
So horses are never naughty, they're never dominant. You get the behavior you reinforce, not the one you want. So look at it from that perspective. Try and find out where the problems are coming from and how to train the behavior you want rather than stopping the one you don't want. Brilliant. Listen, uh, to Gemma and to Claire, thank you. That, that's that been fascinating. We could go on um, certainly another hour and a half. And it's, so it's, it's such a, a rich area. It's, it's something that if people would like to, that we'll certainly return to. So please do keep your ideas coming through by, edu uh, by emailing us to education at worldhorsewelfare.org. So a big thank you to you, Gemma, uh, and the best of luck with the writing up of your, your PhD, which I know is high on the priority list at the moment and and Claire thank you so much and for, sh for the two of you sharing so much wonderful information lots of great comments coming in so it, it's certainly been well received um, and to everyone for joining us tonight it's been it's been great to have you with us please do remember all the webinars are on our YouTube channel so do come go and have a look there and tonight's will be up there shortly uh, we'll be back in a fortnight um, and in the meantime please um, I hope tonight has been given us all some food for thought about how we can better care for our horses and how we can better listen to our horses and understand following on very much on from sue's talk two weeks ago understanding and to, uh, under, what our horses are trying to tell us and making the appropriate actions so thank you for joining us um i hope you do ha have a great couple of weeks take care of yourself here's hoping that the the world of covid19 that we're living in will start to get more positive but from wherever you are please take great care thank you very much